Ohio. At the end of the course, I usually present a review of the entire course and help people prepare for the exam. This year we won't have an exam, but I thought it was important that I tie together some of the concepts that you've been learning and see how they fit with the simulation that you've been playing as well. So this brief presentation is to run us through those topics in the course. The first week, we looked at basic concepts of strategic management, and we started with this model, force part model, environmental scanning, strategy formulation, strategy implementation, and then evaluation and control. When we looked at it, in particular, the more fleshed out model here showed uh, strategy formulation as the second step, but it was where we were going to start in our exploration of strategy. First of all, what is strategy? Well, essentially, it's a plan. It's a plan for a corporation to meet its mission and objectives. And it has to, people at the organization have to ask, where are we now as an organization? Where will we be in the future? And if that's not acceptable, what are we going to have to do in order to change our course? Decisions are strategic when they're rare, when they have important consequences for the organization, and where they're directive or will, will change how the organization works in the future. And we generally start by creating a mission for our, our organization or maybe defining the mission that we already have. We set objectives for ourselves, often for the next year, and we make sure that they're smart. We then develop our strategy, the comprehensive plan, and we put in place policies to make sure that it's implemented. As organizations get larger, they will have a grand corporate strategy, and then each business unit will have a, will have a strategy that fits, is complements this corporate strategy. And then each functional area, the different departments, will have strategies that fit with their business units. Because objectives are needed at all levels. And right down to the level of individual contributors, they'll have objectives to meet the business unit strategies that ultimately support the corporate strategy. The second chapter was about corporate governance and social responsibility. We just covered this chapter last week and we looked at what is it about organizations? Are they inherently evil or, as some people have said in the past, or um, are they simply a collection of people trying to achieve objectives? So we know it's a mechanism established to allow different parties to contribute capital and work together. In corporate governance, is the process that we use with boards of directors, top management and shareholders to determine the direction and performance of a corporation. We went through the responsibilities of the board of directors and setting the corporate strategy and direction and mission of the firm and making sure that they hire and fire the CEO and top management. Uh, two of the main psychological theories about governance are agency theories and that can we can see problems arise in corporations when management only does what's in their own interest and then there's stewardship theory where people who've had a long-term relationship with an organization they feel compelled to satisfy the needs of the organization beyond their own and usually we see a combination of two that top management group includes the executive leadership, and they set the strategic vision for the corporation and manage the strategic um, uh, planning process. We also covered in that chapter corporate social responsibility and ethics. And one of the difficulties when people claim to be moral relativists um, and uh, the ethics essentially don't apply to them. So companies, as a result, often set in a set together a code of ethics to specify how people should behave in their organization and to guide their ethical decision making, they often use a three-part framework. They ask utilitarian question, does it optimize the satisfactions of all the stakeholders of the organization? Do things that we do respect the rights of the individuals involved and is it consistent with the canons of justice and the laws of the country? Now, Archie Carroll um, 
has suggested that there are four responsibilities of business. Most important is the economic, making money. Next important is, is uh, satisfying the legal constraints of a country. And then ethical and discretionary responsibilities are the ones that come later. But they're still important. They're the social responsibilities. The Chicago School, under Milton Friedman, on the other hand, argued that social responsibility should not be applied to businesses. They should simply be trying to maximize profit, and then the shareholders can do whatever they want with that profit, perhaps do socially responsible things. And I think we have both of these views in society today, and often it's a balancing act. In the third chapter, we were looking at the external industry analysis. So we'd move back now to environmental scanning. It's monitoring, evaluating, disseminating information from the external and internal environments. And starts with, when we're looking at the external environment, there's the outside of the circle, the natural physical environment, there's the societal environment with the pest elements, and then there's the task environment. So that societal element, we often say a pest analysis, political, economic, social, and technological forces. Then there's the task environment inside that closer to the organization. And that includes government and local community suppliers, competitors, and customers. So we analyze that to look for changes and trends. As part of that task environment, Michael Porter uh, suggested that there were a number of forces driving industry. And we went through the five forces model. Porter says that the collective strength of those various industries, uh, various forces rather, determine the profit potential in an industry. We also looked at an issues priority matrix in a very simple way of an organization determining which issues they need to concentrate on and perhaps set objectives to write. We walked through many of the weapons that companies use in competitive battles with rivals. And we reviewed what we've often called a positioning map. But we see that companies often cluster together, and those are strategic groups on a positioning map. We created an industry matrix before moving on to the internal scanning. So we're still at the environmental scanning stage, but the internal part of a corporation and we looked at competencies, core competencies, and distinctive competencies. And in the simulation, you built a number of core competencies, and some of you built distinctive competencies that you were able to repeat over and over again and that no one else in the industry could challenge you on. We ask ourselves, is something actually a distinctive competency when it can answer the questions that it's of value, that it's rare, that it's hard to imitate, and that the firm is organized to exploit the resource? And then we want to look at, is it sustainable? Can we have it over the long term? Is it durable? And it, can it be imitated? One of the tools that companies have used much in the last 20 years is the value chain analysis, looking at all the steps in uh, the process of getting products to market, and then refining those steps. The primary activities and support activities and one's constantly looking for ways to refine the process and make it more efficient. In the fifth chapter, we looked at situational analysis and business strategy. And we looked at the various strategies that are available. And Michael Porter, again, has developed uh, a very good model for looking at companies that go with either a low-cost strategy or a differentiation strategy. And you'll remember this picture of the four generic competitive strategies. What you didn't want to be was stuck in the middle, where you hadn't quite decided which strategy you were following, and then you're doing a bit of both, and you end up in trouble. But Michael Porter saw that there was a problem with his model quite a few years ago now, and so he had a fifth strategy, because he saw that companies like Toyota had done something very interesting. They had been a cost leader, and then they started differentiating, and they now were able to be both low cost with high differentiation of their products, and he created a new model, and he called it the best cost provider strategy. And I think we've seen a couple of companies in our industries that have followed that course. 
Now, sometimes companies don't simply compete. They have cooperative strategies like strategic alliances. We looked at a model, the SFAS, for strategy formulation and situation analysis, and we developed our SWOT analysis. And we know that there are problems with SWOT analysis, but they still can be very useful. And we used it to create a TOES analysis, where it actually helps us, after we've developed our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, to develop strategies from those. And you develop TOES analysis yourself. In the next chapter, we looked at corporate strategy, growth strategies like concentration and diversification, stability strategies when a company needs to pause, and then retrenchment strategies when it's in trouble. And some of you have gone through retrenchment strategies in your simulation. The BCG matrix is a tool that was developed by the Dawson Consulting Group to help companies manage a portfolio of either strategic business units or products. And we saw that there were four types of products, question marks, stars, cash cows, and dogs. And I'm sure you remember um, the importance of each of those. And the suggestions here on what one does when one has a product or a group of products that are in different parts of the matrix. You want to build stars and then as they grow older in their development to cash, uh, turn them into cash cows to generate more profit to grow. In the seventh chapter, we looked at functional strategy and strategic choice. And this is each department, each area in a company has its own strategies that it develops. Uh, and examples were the R&D strategy where you could be a technological leader or a technological follower, and they can both be very effective. In marketing, we develop our strategies to capture larger market share and with the market development strategies, or we might have product development strategies. And a particular tool that's been around for a long time now is ANSAW's matrix to help you plan for your growth. And we gave an exercise in that. The eighth chapter was strategy implementation. How do we organize ourselves? And we need to know who are the people who are going to carry out our strategic plan, what has to be done to align the operations in our intended direction, and how is everyone going to work together? So it involved different organizational structures, and one designs the structure based on the strategy to implement it. We do see most organizations go through a number of stages, birth, growth, maturity, decline, and potentially death. And we want to find ways that we can, when we start to move into a decline stage, to move back into an earlier growth or maturity stage. One of the tools companies have used extensively and that you used in the simulation is Six Sigma training to have fewer and fewer defects. And Lean Six Sigma um, is a one further development in that area. When it came to staffing and leading for action, we know that it follows strategy. And with growth strategies, you're hiring people and training current staff. Retrenchment strategies, you're often laying off people and you have to develop criteria and decide on how you will do that effectively. Different leadership types often are best for different strategies. And retrenchment certainly causes problems. When you start downsizing, while you may make a few benefits in terms of your costs, it can really have a damaging effect on the company in the long run. Similar things can happen when there are takeovers of companies. And uh, we looked at an interesting model on how one manages to either run as separate country companies or to integrate two companies together. One of the main tools uh, developed by Peter Drucker was management by objectives and virtually every large company in the world now uses some form of management by objectives. Total quality management also has been very important in terms of a process to improve uh, performance of companies over time. And that brings us to the final chapter in the text, Evaluation and Control, where we saw that so many companies did, did not succeed in implementing their strategy because either it was a poor strategy or poor implementation.